is, it's important to generate this longitudinal vortex. While the central flow is a simple spiral, the external peripheral flows is a double spiral movement, a rotation about the central spiral, which acts in a way like ball bearings and uh, facilitates the faster flow of the central core water. This double spiral movement is inaugurated by the emplacement of guide vanes which deflect the water from an otherwise straight path into a spiral path. And these, in Victor Schauberger's concept, would be silver-plated copper placed in a wooden pipe at certain intervals to create or provoke or promote this centripetal spiral flow. This spiral movement is the rejuvenating movement which endows water with fresh energy and also uh, because of the movement and because of the way the oxygen is separated from the core water initially and diverted to the outside certain bacteria and pathogenic bacteria anaerobic bacteria are exposed to excess oxygen and die off and in the process uh, the longer the movement down such a pipe the purer and the more bacteria free the water becomes. Water has certain patterns of motion it has certain energies and these energies are derived from its motion and unless it is able to move in the way that generates its energies then it becomes a sluggish and slack. It's very important for water to be able to generate a longitudinal vortex in its flow which enables it not only to reoxygenate itself but also to cool itself. The oxygen is passive and it's not aggressive towards the water itself because of this movement the water is cool and after it has disposed of all the pathogens by over oxygenating them then it returns to seek union with those mother substances which are as yet unfertilized and this increases the energy and of course there's a certain amount of birth of new water in the process. So you have a tremendous rejuvenation of the water body on the way to the point of delivery. The core of the vortex is identifiably cooler than the surrounding water masses by as much maybe as 0.2 of a degree centigrade. So in their summation of all these little cooling processes then the water when allowed to flow naturally cools itself quite considerably. And so the vortex is a cooling process. Not only that, the water re-energizes itself and it also divests itself of harmful parasites, pathogens and so on. Because of the difference in the specific weight of oxygen and hydrogen in the water and other substances, the oxygen is thrown to the side of the pipe and directed to the pipe walls. Water moving in such a way can transport ores and other material similar to that down the middle, down the center of the water vortex without touching the sides and actually can improve the quality of the ores such as iron ore in transit on the way to the point of use because as the oxygen is gradually consumed, some of it by the extermination of pathogenic bacteria, there is a reduction process occurring in the water flow itself so the iron ore is already partially reduced, so to speak, um, before it arrives at the smelter. Our spinal column, in German, is expressed as a spiral column. And each of the vertebra are called vortices. And so when you take this image in conjunction with the German view of the structure which upholds the human body, then here again in their concept it is also related to movement and vertical movement. Energy is primary and physical form is a secondary effect. In terms of the DNA molecule that is the programming which creates the whole of the physical body. So in 
in elaboration of this movement, energy creates the pathways through which it wants to move or in which it wants to express itself. It's very important to begin to employ systems or to convert existing systems into ways of moving water which follows the law governing the flow of water, takes temperature into consideration, takes the alternating pulsating movement of water into consideration because this is a substance which is a living substance and it cannot impart life unless it is itself alive. So there's this constantly changing aspect of natural form which is reflected in the seashells, reflected in the dynamics of the universe. It's this fall shape. Nature is not working as not wheels and wheels but they're falls and falls. There's one spiral moving inside another spiral as energy because energy it must be remembered is always primary and physical form is the secondary effect. We have to turn this around in our heads and remember that energy is primary that nothing can appear in the physical until it has been first conceived of energetically and the formation of anything physical is the concentration of the image until the physical form is realized. And this is one of the things that Victor Schauberger stated on many occasions, that energy is primary and physical form is the secondary effect. This concentration of higher energies, immaterial energies, gradually coalesce into more energies of a lower frequency, finally having the physical effect and the physical form. Analogously, we might say that the energies coming from the sun, the X-ray energies and the high frequency energies of the sun, impinge on the Earth's atmosphere and they cause thermal variations, they cause the movement of winds, which is a lower form of energy than the energy coming from the sun. And these winds blow around the planet and on the surface of the planet are the oceans and the winds impinge on the water which is a more dense medium than the air and waves are created and finally on the shore these waves create ripples on the sand which is the very densest of the medium and so you can see how the higher energies of the sun are actually responsible for the ripples on the ocean floor so the ultimate effect if we're talking purely energetically so to speak is that we've had three levels of energy demodulation, so to speak, from the sun to the air to the water, and finally the physical form, the ripples on the sand, have been created. The whole process of nature's ev evolution or her workings um, are put back to front because things are taken as <clears throat> a cause when in fact they are an effect, and they are an effect in a long series of causes and effects. And what we are seeing around the world today in terms of the treatment of water um, and the forests are the massive inundations in China, in Bangladesh and other places in the world which are due to deforestation. What happens here is related again to this peculiar anomaly state of water. Victor described a movement of temperature which uh, from any higher temperature down towards um, 4 degrees as being what he called a positive temperature gradient. And a negative temperature gradient was a temperature which moved up in the opposite direction from 4 degrees either down or upwards, anyway away from 4 degrees which was the condition of temperaturelessness or, or indifference as uh, Victor called it. Now the temperature gradient plays an enormous role in the, the Earth's water balance and it's something which is not really understood and it's very important that it should be understood because if it's not we shall go on having the same series of drought um, deluge, drought, deluge and these massive um, flooding and inundations which we're experiencing at the moment. Now water has to be handled with great sensitivity. It is a substance which is alive. It has to be treated as something alive Therefore, it should not be exposed to excess heat, it should not be exposed to excess pressure 
all those things we know in our human body are destructive. And the same thing applies to water. As long as water is able to flow in vortices down a river, which and, and to have a movement, and a flowing sort of waltzing movement to left and right as it spirals around one bend in one way and one the other, then it's able to generate these cooling vortices. And this always, no matter what the external conditions, or at least to a certain extent, no matter what the external conditions, the water is able to cool itself towards its all-important state of temperaturelessness, which is four degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, with many of the practices, um, hydraulic practices, river engineering practices, and so on, uh, water is forced and confined to flow in straight channels. Uh, and these channels are really like a straight jacket on water. It stops its free movement. It's not able to move. It's not able to waltz from left to right. It, all its ability to generate these vortices is removed from it and as a living substance it becomes diseased and when forced to move in such such or be conducted in such a way then because it can't cool itself it warms up and the oxygen content becomes aggressive and fosters the development of parasitic life forms bacteria and so on because the water has become too warm and its energy like we have in our body we have energies which enhance our immune system. When those become depleted, then we get sick. And the same thing happens to water. And the greatest and most sensitive care must be taken of water if it is to fulfill its functions, which is to support life. Because life without water is unthinkable. And one of the great fallacies in economic theory today is, or not fallacies, but sort of mistaken thinking, is that the world can continue to move, uh, to, to grow in its materialistic way on the assumption that, that there can be no limit to quantitative growth. Of course there must be because this planet is finite and there's a finite number of uh, artifacts or finite materials, raw materials. When earth, rain falls onto the earth, it falls, the rain has a certain temperature the earth, in order to absorb the rain, must have a cooler temperature. This is a positive temperature gradient because we are going from a hotter to a cooler temperature through the ground. If, as long as the ground is cooler than the incident rain, the water will infiltrate. And that really happens under conditions of healthy forest or healthy vegetation, which cools the ground. That means the water is absorbed and in forestry conditions, 85% um, of the water that falls will be absorbed by the ground and, and won't be released, for instance, till two or three days after, even if it's heavy rain. Now, the, if we have a, removed the trees, if the ground has been warmed up, then we have the existence of a negative temperature gradient from the atmosphere into the ground, in that the rain is cooler, but the, gr the receiving ground is warmer. And as a result, the water will not penetrate but run sideways. Like you put a drop of water on an electric hot plate, it skitters sideways and steams. And this steaming is the same thing that happens to the water, which has fallen on the ground under a negative temperature gradient. And that because it is not absorbed, much larger areas of water are exposed to the sun, and there's a much faster and abnormal r rate of evaporation, which means that a very large amount of water is returned to the atmosphere far too quickly. And as a result of that, you have large agglomerations of water here, no water there, deluges here, drought there. And that is all because the water balance has been disrupted by and large by humankind's activities in forestry and agriculture and water resources management. And we are paying the price for that now, and there is only one solution and that is to reforest as fast as possible because then the water will be uh, allowed to enter into the aquifer systems underground a lot of carbon dioxide will be absorbed in the, tran in the photosynthetic process the climate will be cooled and the water balance regulated and then we can expect to have after that 
um, more uh, even and regular climate.